And welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist to Spanish and English speaking people. And today's sermon is entitled Understanding the Bible. Understanding the Bible. My desire today is to help you to understand the Word of God. I still get emails from people all around the world who don't understand the Bible. They just don't get it. They're confused and they don't understand the Word of God. There are many different denominations in the world today and they all teach something different. I got an email not too long ago of someone asking me, why is that? Why are there so many different denominations within Christianity and they all teach something different? Well, it's because they don't understand the Word of God. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to present to you the Bible as it's laid out, as it's given to us. I'm not going to teach a denominational teaching or what some church believes or what some religious sect believes. I'm just going to simply show you what the Bible says itself about itself. And I hope that if you are confused, that this will help clear up all confusion and you'll, you'll be helped and you'll see how to understand the Word of God. I'd like to start with my opening text of 2 Timothy 2.7. 2 Timothy 2.7 says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. That's my prayer for you today, is just consider what I say unto you, and that you ask the Lord to give you understanding. Because I just want to present what the Bible says, not my opinion, not what some denomination says or anything like that. Just simply look at what the Bible says. I won't be giving any private interpretation or anything like that. I'm simply going to give you what the Word of God says. Now let's go to Luke chapter 24 and verse 45 as well. Luke 24, 45. And it's speaking about Jesus. And let's begin in verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were spoken in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. It's talking about Jesus. Jesus is speaking. And it says, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. So I just ask that you would pray and ask the Lord to open your understanding. And what I want to do today is try to help you to understand the Bible. It's not that hard. All you have to do is read it. But unfortunately, there's so, so, so many so-called denominations today that call themselves Christians, and they all seem to have a different understanding. Why is it they teach something different? Well, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. It's because they're following tradition rather than the Word of God. Oftentimes, many people get into this denominational setting in which their church teaches in a certain way, so they're following what their church teaches or how they, in, they interpret or understand. So basically, they're teaching their traditions rather than the Scriptures. What does the Bible say about that? Well, in the Gospels it says tradition makes the Word of God an effect. I'm not interested in a tradition or a religion or a teaching of a certain denomination. I just simply want to know, what does the Bible say about it? So that's what I want to do today is open up your eyes to the understanding of the Scriptures by simply presenting to you what the Scriptures say about themselves. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, a command from God says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we're instructed here in the Word of God to study. What are we supposed to study? Well, we're supposed to study the Word of God. And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to rightly divide. That means we go to the Bible and we look at the Bible and we say, okay, now, what does this say and who does it written to? When was this written? What was it saying? What is it about? And when we study the Word of God, we make divisions in the Word of God and we rightly divide. Now, why would we rightly divide? Well, because there's certain things in the Bible that are written to us and certain things that are not. You see, all the Bible is written for us to read, but not all parts of the Bible apply to us doctrinally. Some parts of the Bible are written only to Jews. Other parts of the Bible are written only to Gentiles and things like that. So you have to rightly divide the Word of God. You've got to look at the Bible and say, okay, how do I rightly divide this? Well, the only way to learn the Bible and rightly divide is to be saved. Back in Corinthians, it tells us that the book is spiritually discerned and we have to have the Holy Spirit to understand the Bible. The problem with many so-called denominations today is there's a lot of lost people that read the Bible. And they don't have the Holy Spirit to guide and lead them. And so what do they do? They usually fall into error. Many de different denominations and different denominational teachings exist today because lost people read the Bible without the Holy Spirit of God 
and they don't ever rightly divide, and they get in a mess. Boy, do they get in a mess. And they wrongly divide. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but I've got a video on YouTube in the Mayo entitled, entitled Wrongly Dividing the Word of God. And it shows you what happens if you don't rightly divide. What a mess you get into. What a mess you get into. So what we're going to do today, we're going to start out, and I think the best way to explain the difference is to make the first division. The way we firstly divide the Word of God is we divide the Old Testament, I'm writing in Spanish, the Old Testament from the New Testament. So, here's what we do. We take and we rightly divide the Word of God. And the Bible says that there's a division that we can make between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And I was thinking about this the other day, and I was reading, and I was studying, and I was thinking, hmm, how am I going to present this? And, and I thought, you know what's, what's a good way to present this is, is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, but also, you know, there's five books in the first part of the Old Testament. Those five books are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Duet, no, not Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. Now, those are the first five books of the Old Testament. Well, we have in our Bible, we open it up and we see, oh, it says Old Testament, New Testament, and the first five books in the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. So, if you begin to study the Old Testament and the Jewish law, the first five books of the Old Testament are called the Pentateuch. And it's where the Jews get their Old Testament law from. In the New Testament, we have five books as well that are very, very important. You see, these Old Testament five books are the entirety of the law. And a lot of the rest of the Old Testament books all go back to this, the law. Well, if we're going to go to the New Testament, which is where we are today, we need to look at the first five books of the Bible. That doesn't mean we don't look at the rest of the Bible. We do. But the first five books of the Bible are so important to understand the day and age in which we live. Because after the book of Acts, there come some other books, Romans to Philemon. Guess what? Romans to Philemon are books by Paul. Who's Paul? Oh, he's just the guy that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. <laughs> Interesting. A lot of people today don't know what to do with Paul. You go to many so-called Christian denominations, and Many of them today say, well, we don't follow Paul. We don't have anything to do with Paul. Many confess, I don't even know why Paul is in the Bible. So in order to understand the Bible, let's, let's, let's start out by saying, well, there's five main books in the Old Testament, the first five called the Law, and there's five books in the New Testament that are written by other people than Paul. What are the five books about? What, we're just going to look at these here in a second. But before we do, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. And uh, let me begin reading there in verse 15. Hebrews 9, 15 says, And for this cause he, Jesus, is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. 16, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all, while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined you. So in the Old Testament, God got a book and he put some blood on that book. He also put the blood on the ear and on the toe and on the foot, or hand, excuse me, finger, right thumb I believe it is. And that started the Old Testament. And the Old Testament went right up to here. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ died on the cross. So when Jesus Christ shed his blood, the Bible says the New Testament starts with the death of the testator, 
So the New Testament began with Jesus Christ shedding his blood on Calvary. So both the Old Testament and the New Testament began with blood. In Moses' case, it was the blood of animals. But when Jesus Christ came and shed his blood, that started a New Testament. So today, we are in the New Testament. And that's what's so important. And what's so sad is there's some people that claim to be Christians today that don't even rightly divide that. A lot of them think we're still under these, the Old Testament law and the books of the Old Testament. We're no longer under that testament. We're under this testament. But let's look at some verses about this. Go to Matthew chapter 26. I just want to give you as many verses as I can. And what I'm trying to do is showing you how to understand the Bible. I want to make sure that we're on the same page, that you understand what I understand. Because this isn't just what I think, or my opinion, or my belief, or my doctrinal teaching from my denomination. This is what the Bible itself teaches, and it can't be denied. We have to agree. This is what God says, so we've got to agree on this. In order to be Christians, we should be in agreement. Matthew 26, 28. Jesus Christ is speaking, and what does he say? For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So Jesus Christ says, look, my blood is shed for the remission of sins. It's the blood of the New Testament. So the blood Christ Jesus shed is what started the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. We are instructed in the Word of God to be ministers of a certain testament. So are we today ministers of the Old Testament, or are we ministers of the New Testament? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6 says, well, let me read verse 5 too in context, not that we were sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So, here we read that today, in the time in which we live, because we don't live back here before the shedding of Christ's blood, so we're not in the Old Testament. Here where we live in the New Testament, we're supposed to be ministers of the New Testament, which is the ministers of the testator, ministers of the blood that Jesus Christ shed. So what are we today? Well, we're in the New Testament. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now, sadly, there claim to be some today who call themselves Christians that don't understand what I've just presented. You would think this would be the easiest thing to grab. <laughs> but today there are still people that call themselves Christians that are living back here and they don't want the blood of the New Testament. They want to be under this Old Testament law. And what does the Bible say about such people? Well, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 warns us about such people. 1 Timothy 1, 6 and 7 says, for which some, having swerved, have turned aside into vain jingling. That means empty talk. And it says in verse 7, Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they affirm. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? There's a lot of people that desire to be teachers of this law, and say, oh, we're under the Old Testament law, you've got to keep the law, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And the Bible says they don't even understand what they're talking about. Why is that? Well, because we're no longer under the Old Testament, we're under the New Testament. So why do people not understand which testament they're in? I don't know. But there are so-called Christians in the world today that say, well, we still believe that we have to keep the Old Testament law. What does it mean to keep the Old Testament law? Well, if you had to keep the Old Testament law, then first of all, you need to be circumcised. And, and funny as it sounds, but the truth is, many people today who claim to be under this Old Testament law, they're not even circumcised. But that was what they had to do to be under the law. In order to get yourself under the Old Testament law, there had to be some bloodshed on your part by being circumcised. So if a person's not circumcised, a man, then he's not under the law. Now, are we under that Old Testament law? I don't see how if we're in the New Testament. I mean, they're two different things. You know, things that are different are not the same. And they're two different time periods. So what does the Bible say? Are we under the Old Testament still? Are we under the law? Um, we read in Romans 10 and verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for everyone to, 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 uh, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So Christ Jesus, he who shed his blood, the death of the testator, 
is the end of the law for everyone who believes. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14 says, For sin shall have no more dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So we today, who are saved by trusting in Christ's shed blood, the blood atonement, we're not under the law. We're under what the Bible calls grace. You see, we're saved by grace. We're not saved by works. Back here, it was by works that a person could be saved. We're not saved by works. Now, Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. I mean, there's so many verses in Romans, it's hard for me to understand how a person couldn't see this. But in Romans chapter 7, it says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. I am dead to that law. I can't try to go back under that law, or else I'll be called an adulterer. My husband is Jesus. I'm married to him. I'm part of his body. So I can't try to get back under that. I'm under this. I'm under grace. That's what the Bible teaches. Yet, unfortunately, there's people today that claim to be Christians that don't even see that. They don't understand the Word of God. Romans chapter 9. Look at this. This is so simple. Romans chapter 9 and verse 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to the righteousness to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, that's this law, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. You see, these people in the Old Testament, they were trying by works to be righteous in God's eyes. And God was saying, you don't understand. You can't be saved by the law. I gave you the law to show you what sin is. You know, there's a verse that says the law is the knowledge of sin. But no matter how good you do, you still can't be saved. He says salvation is by faith. Grace through faith. And today we attain unto righteousness. We're saved and we're imputed God's righteousness when we believe we're saved by faith. So that's something you've got to understand in order to understand the Bible. Go to Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. I'm just going through these verses quickly. Because if you don't understand this, how can you be saved? You've got to understand that I can't be saved by the law. I'm saved only by grace through faith. So you've got to understand this. Yet there's many, many people that claim to be Christians today that aren't even saved. Because they don't understand that it's not the law that saves. It's Jesus and faith in the gospel that saves us. Galatians 2.16 says it plainly and clearly. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So to study the word of God and to not be ashamed and to rightly divide is to realize, Oh, I understand that I'm no longer under this period known as the law. That ended with the death of a testator and began a new testament and that works are not what saves in this testament. We are saved by grace through faith alone. Grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ. Back to Romans. Oh, there's so many good word, uh, verses in Romans. Romans chapter 3 and verse 25 through 28. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So there's what our faith should be in. Faith in his blood. Are you trusting in the blood that Jesus Christ shed? That blood that he shed is what saves. That's known as the blood atonement of Christ. You see, it's two completely different testaments and two completely different bloods. Under this testament, it was the blood of animals. And you had to sacrifice those animals' blood in order to have your sins taken away. Well, here... We're saved by the other blood. It's Jesus' blood, the blood atonement of Christ. 
Now, there are some people that claim to be of a certain denomination today that claim to be Christians that say, no, 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 we can be saved by Jesus, but we still go back under this testament. No, 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 no. You can't have them both. It's one or the other. It's either you're under the law and you're saved by works, or you're under grace and you're saved by faith in what Jesus did. It cannot be both. So, we continue reading here in verse 25. Through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Can we be saved by works? Nay, but by the law of faith. So the law that we're under today is not this law of, my, of these five books in the Old Testament. The law we're saved by today is the law of faith, because it's faith that saves. Huh. And then it says here, verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So justification or salvation comes by faith. When I believe, I'm justified without the works of the law, without the deeds of the law. So it's not by works that I'm saved. So we're not saved by the law or by keeping the law. That would be salvation by works. We're saved by faith alone. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But I've met them, and maybe you have too. Many people that claim to be Christians. And you ask them, well, are you saved? Well, I'm working on it, you know, I'm keeping the law, I'm doing all this stuff. And you ask them, and then you say, well, how do you think you get saved? Well, i got to be under the law and do this. And the Bible says, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And what are they doing? In their mind, they're believing that if they do good works, then they'll get to heaven. Many of them I've talked to, and they're just as lost as a golf ball in high weeds. It's so sad. They're not saved. But many of them say, well, if my good works outweigh my bad works, then maybe, just maybe, I'll get to heaven. Such people, are they saved? No. They think if I do more good than evil, then I'll go to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you've uh, broken the law in one point, you're guilty of all. You can't get to heaven by doing good. You get to heaven by trusting what Jesus did for you. So such people do not understand the Bible. The most basic division in the entire word, they don't understand. I'll be close here with Galatians 3, 24 and 20. 6, and then I'll move on to what I want to get to. But Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, now watch this, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. So the law equals the schoolmaster, right? If the, school, the law is the schoolmaster, and the only reason that God gave the law was to bring us to Jesus, that means when we come to Jesus, then we're no longer under the law. Huh. Yet there are people, and they've made, I've met them before, I've talked to them, I've gotten emails from them, phone calls, I've seen people made some videos against me online, saying, you're wrong, Gregor, we're still under the law. What Bible do they read? <laughs> do they even understand the Bible? Because I'm giving you verses and these verses say that we're no longer under the law, and that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, so the law is to bring you to Jesus, and that once you're at Jesus, once you come to Him, once you trust Him by faith, trusting His gospel, you're saved. You're no longer under that. You're in a completely different testament. Let me read it again. Galatians 2, 24. Well, 22. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. 23, But before faith came, we were all kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should be afterwards be revealed. Yeah. And then verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So we're not saved by the law. We're saved by faith. But the law brings us to Christ. You see, all the law does is show you what's wrong. God says, Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And you're supposed to read that and go, but I did it already. And God says, okay, now if you want to be forgiven for those things I told you not to do, then you come to me and my testament, trusting my blood atonement, and by faith I'll forgive you. And I'll cleanse you from all your sins. 
So verse 24 says the law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, but verse 25 says, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. Do you know what that means? That means if you still think you've got to keep the law to be saved, then you have not come to Jesus Christ, which means you have not been forgiven and you're not saved. So if you belong to a denomination that says, we've got to keep the law, you've got to keep the law to get to heaven, you're lost. And guess where you're going to open up your eyes as soon as you die? In hell. Burning for all eternity. Because you did not come to Jesus Christ. Verse 26, for we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So salvation is through Christ alone. Now this is important because some think that they are still under the Old Testament law. But we're not there. And you can't be saved by that law. The, the law was supposed to point you to Jesus, the only one that never sinned, so you'll trust Him, the sinless substitute, and be saved. Now there are others that claim to be Christians today that don't understand the Bible. Now they grasp what I've just presented to you, and they say, oh, we're not under the law, we understand that, it's all about Jesus. But when you ask them, okay, well, what do you believe in to get to heaven? They say, well, we believe in Jesus. And so they go to this early ministry of Jesus, and you ask them, what's your doctrine? What do you believe? How do you believe you're saved? And they say, well, we're just saved by following Jesus. Um, huh? Okay, you know, what, what do you follow? What do you, well, we go to Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, and we go through all that, and it says, take up your cross and follow him, so we grab a cross and we follow, and, and you're like, okay. All right, well, well, tell me more. Oh, well, we just believe in following Jesus and his principles and the good things that he said. And, and, and you're like, okay. <laughs> but all those things were before the New Testament. You see, these books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are in the Bible in what they call the New Testament. But if you think about it for a second, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everything that happens in those books is still happening in the Old Testament until Jesus actually dies in those books. So that means what takes place in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John until Jesus literally dies, which is usually toward the end of each one of those books, that means it's still Old Testament. Everything in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is still taking place in the Old Testament until Jesus actually dies. Do you understand that? So how can we today claim to be Christians and say, I'm Christian, I'm following Jesus, and then take all of our doctrine from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John from their verses of Scripture that were still in the Old Testament and not New Testament? Do you, do you understand? I've got a friend, boy, I love him, but he's lost. He belongs to a church that tells him, well, you do these things and you follow this and you follow that, and, and all they preach is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John before Jesus died, and they say, now baptize yourself in water and you'll go to heaven. And what are they teaching? They're teaching a doctrine that's still Old Testament. Why aren't they pointing to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? Why aren't they pointing to the cross and saying, now just trust what Jesus did and be saved by faith? They, they don't. They're teaching, you do this work, get baptized in water, do good things, do, right, do all this. And so they're just as bad as those people that are saying you've got to keep the law because they're teaching their works you have to do. And the works aren't keep the law. The works are get baptized in water and do this and this and this. Well, does water baptism save? Uh, no. So we've got a problem. We've got a problem. We've got people that claim to be Christians that don't understand the Word of God. Now, what I want to do briefly is quickly is I'm going to go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm going to show you how those books are written and to whom they are written and what they talk about. Because you take the first four books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if that's all you have, you're going to have a hard time getting saved. There is a reason that there's a fifth book in the New Testament. Just like there were five books in the Old Testament that made up the Old Testament law, the Pentateuch, there are five important books in the New Testament, and you've got to read all five of them to understand the Bible. Sadly, many Christians today only read those four. And then they come out not understanding completely the Word of God. And oftentimes they end up lost. Now listen quickly, I'm not saying that you can't get saved. I've had people tell me, I got saved reading the book of John. I say, praise God. I had somebody tell me, I got saved reading Mark one time. Okay, alright, I'm not saying you can't get saved from those books. But, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, most of those books are still Old Testament until Jesus dies. Now those books are called Gospels, the Gospels of Mark, 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why are they called Gospels? Because they all tell us about the Gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4 says the Gospel is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. So as you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, just about every one of them tells you that Jesus died. And when they say He died on the cross, that's when He shed His blood, that's when the New Testament started. And then, just about every one of them tell you that Jesus rose again. So they're called Gospels because they talk about the death, burial, and resurrection. But that's not all they talk about. Most of the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are talking more about the ministry of Jesus and what He did in His life here on earth. So, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the majority of those books is still Old Testament. And it's kind of hard to get saved from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because there's a lot more written later in the New Testament by Paul. And actually, it's Paul who tells us what this gospel is and how we're saved by faith. So let's look at that. Let's understand the Bible. Matthew is a book that was written, and Matthew was written to portray Jesus as the king of the Jews. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just quickly write down how each one of the Gospels portrays Jesus Christ. Each one of these got me. People say, why are there four different Gospels and they all say the same thing? Well, each one of them was written for a different purpose. And each one is to show you a certain aspect of what Jesus is. Each one portrays Jesus in a different way. You see, over here we've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Well, Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Exodus, they kind of overlap each other. Some of the things written in Deuteronomy were written in Leviticus or Exodus. So this is called the law. And Deuteronomy, you know the word Deuteronomy means literally second, law giving. Deuter means second. It's like God gave you the law and then he goes, I'm going to give it to you again, just so you don't forget it. One of the best ways to remember is by repetition. You know, my dad used to always say, how do you remember things? I said, well, by repetition. He goes, nope, it's repetition, repetition, repetition. <laughs> he really drived in hard. You've got to remember. And the best way to remember is to hear it over and over and over again. So God gave these books of the law. He could have condensed it into one big book, but he didn't. He gave us five different books in the Old Testament and said, that's the law. Well, here in the New Testament, God gave us one, two, three, four different Gospels, and he's saying the same thing over quite often to really drive it home so we don't forget. <laughs> so there's a reason that God gave, that, gave this in a certain way. But each one of these books is a little different in the way that it presents Jesus. Let me write that up here for you. And as you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, sometimes there's an overlap. Sometimes they talk about some of the same things. Uh, other times, there's one thing mentioned in just one of them that's not mentioned in the others. John is a little bit different. So what I want to do is I want to try to present this to you in such a way in the hopes that it will help you to understand the Word of God. So the book of Matthew was written, and the theme of the book of Matthew, if you will, how, how Matthew portrays Jesus is as the King of the Jews. So Matthew wrote his book for a purpose. Why did the Apostle Matthew write the book of Matthew? Because he wanted the people that read that book to see that Jesus Christ was the King of the Jews. And as them seeing him as their king, they would then see him as Christ or the Messiah. So who was Matthew writing the book of Matthew to? Well, he was writing it so that people, Jews, could see Jesus is king and Messiah. The book of Mark portrays Jesus Christ as God's servant. So he's showing Jesus as the servant of Jehovah, of God. And he wants them to see that as God's servant, he was, in fact, the Messiah the Christ, the one of Israel, sent as their king. Luke presents Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. Kind of shows him and says he's a prophet, and it talks about prophecy. And oftentimes uh, he talks about how Jesus Christ was shown as a prophet who prophesied and showed about the prophecies of him. So he presented Jesus as the Son of Man. Now John presents Jesus Christ as the Son of God. By so doing, he literally declares Jesus is God. And if that's true, then who is Jesus? He's the Messiah. He is the Christ. So do you see how they're all just a little bit different, and each one portrays Jesus in a different way? That's amazing. Now, 
each one of these closes in a different way as well. And the way these books close is kind of interesting. Matthew closes with the resurrection of Jesus. I'll just abbreviate it. Mark, the book of Mark, ends with the ascension of Jesus. I'll abbreviate that as well. Luke ends in the Feast of Pentecost. And the book of John ends with what appears to be the rapture. Hmm, that's interesting. Although it's not, it's really... A lot of people call it the rapture. It's uh, How's the best way to explain John? He closes with saying that someone won't die. Well, who do we know that doesn't die? In the church age, when the rapture comes, we leave without dying. So some people say it's, it's you know, applying to the rapture, uh, maybe spiritually or in type. So you've got the three different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they all present Jesus as the Christ. And that's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written for, is they were written by Jews, for Jews, to try to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. And so many of the things that are written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are still Old Testament when Jesus was a Jew coming to Jews. Now, in Jesus' ministry, Jesus said, I came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus Christ says, my ministry here was a Jew to Jews. But many churches today try to take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and take what's written there and apply it to the church. And they say, we follow Jesus, man. Is that right? Well, if it's still Old Testament, how, how can that really apply to today? Do you see the problem you get into? You're taking some things that were still taking place in the Old Testament for Jews and trying to force it into the church. And it doesn't always work. Our doctrine for the church today is from Romans through Philemon. And we'll get into that in a minute. Now let's look at Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. I want to show you some things about these books. The book of Matthew was written to Jews to show them that Jesus Christ is their King and Messiah. How does the book of Matthew end? Let's go to Matthew and look at the ending of the book of Matthew. It ends with chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28 ends like this. Many people today call this the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28 ends in verse 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. These are the last words of Jesus in the book of Matthew. He says, Go baptize people in water and tell them to follow me. Now, that's a New Testament. So, does that apply to today? Well, many people say, Yes, yes, and that's their whole ministry. The Church of God, or Church of Christ, I think it is. That's what they do. They say, we follow Jesus, we go down and baptize people in water. You can't be saved unless you're baptized in water, is what they teach. Well, Jesus Christ said he came to the Jews, and that's what the Jews had to do. Could it be more to Jews? Is that, is that, I mean, you know, where's the gospel? We're told that preach the gospel. Paul tells us we're saved by the gospel. Where's the gospel here? Where, where's, hmm, that's interesting. So, I mean, I'm not against water baptism, you know, you want to get baptized in water, go ahead, but, that, but don't preach that that saves you. See, that's the problem. Water baptism does not save us, we're saved by the blood, Ephesians 1.7, Colossians 1.14. The blood is what washes our sins away, not water. So this is Matthew, and this is what Matthew says to do at the end of the book. Now Mark. Mark was written to Jews to show them Jesus as their servant. Now, how does the book of Mark end? Well, let's go over to Mark chapter 16. And uh, let's see if we can figure this out. Mark chapter 16 says, here in 16, I'll begin in verse 15. He said to them, Preach ye in all the world, and, uh, or go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that it believeth not shall be damned. Oh, okay, so go in the world and preach the gospel. There, it mentions the gospel, so there you go. You know, that's cool. But let's, let's continue the context and see if this is really for us, Gentiles, who are saved, or if this isn't more of a directive to Jews and Jewish disciples. Because verse 17 says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, shall they speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. 
These are what are called the signs of the apostles. And thank God we have this fifth book, the book of Acts. Because as you read the book of Acts, you know what you see? You see a change, you see a transition in the Bible from the early Jewish apostles to one man, Paul, an apostle. And those signs of them being able to do those things eventually, uh, to coin a phrase, petered out. <laughs> the signs were for the Jews. But Paul, our apostle, says, we don't seek after a sign. Well, that's quite revealing, isn't it not? Now let's go to Luke. Luke was written to, believe it or not, a Gentile guy to tell him about the things that happened in Jesus' ministry. Let's look at uh, Luke chapter 1. For as much as have many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Okay, So he says there's other people that wrote uh, um, Gospels to tell what happened in Jesus' ministry among us, the apostles. He says, Even as they delivered them unto us, which for from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Here's Luke, and Luke says, I have had perfect understanding from the beginning of understanding all things. And I'm going to write to you, Mr. Theophilus. And who was Theophilus? Well, to this day, few people know. Whoever he was, he was a guy that wanted to know about what happened in the ministry of Jesus. So, Luke is writing his gospel here, and he says, Theophilus, um, I'm going to tell you about the ministry of Jesus, because I have a perfect understanding of the things from the very first that took place. So Luke says, from the very first, I'm going to tell you what happened. Do you know Luke wrote another book? Why, did you know that Luke also wrote the book of Acts? Now, why would Luke write another book? I mean, if we're saved by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and everything in there is the doctrine for us today, then why would you need a separate book? Why would he write Acts? Why is Acts in the Bible? Wouldn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John be enough? Well, many denominations say it is enough, and we're saved by reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and nothing else. <laughs> okay. All right, well, well let's, let's look at this. Why, why, uh, hmm, all right, let me get to that in a minute. No, no, let's go there now. Go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, remember, Acts was written by Luke. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. All right, here's the Theophilus guy again. Luke is writing the book of Acts to this guy. And he says, I wrote to you the former treatise, Luke, to tell of all that Jesus both began to do and teach. So the book of Acts, he, in the book of Acts, he says, I wrote that other treatise about the things that Jesus began to do and say. So if Jesus began something back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts is what God continued doing. And what we'll find as we understand the Bible and read the Bible is that the book of Acts is a transitional book. It's a change. Because something changes in the book of Acts. And you can't stop at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because most of what they write about is the ministry of Jesus. You have to read Acts because there's something going on in the future and something changes. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is just the beginning of what Jesus began to do. He did a whole lot more later and that's why we have the book of Acts. So that's why it's important to read the book of Acts. Now, let's finish up when we're talking about Luke here. Luke chapter 24 and verse 26. Luke 24, 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Verse 44. We read earlier. The things he fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled some things. Verse 44. 6, And he said unto them, Jesus, Thus it was written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And here are eyewitnesses of these things. So there were some things beginning to take place. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all the beginning, but they weren't the end. 
You see the mess you get into if you omit Acts and the rest of the New Testament. But many so-called Christian denominations today, all they do is say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's for us. That's all we take our doctrine from. I've talked to many people around the world, and they say, Brother Breaker, I'm so tired of going to church because all they ever do is preach from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why won't they preach from Romans? Why won't they preach from different books like First and Second Timothy? And why don't they go to you know, Galatians? Why are they just spending all their time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Well, two things. Either they don't understand the Bible, or they're lazy, low-down, sorry, good-for-nothing ministers who are too lazy to read any further in the Bible than the first four books. <laughs> That's the only thing I can come up with. So Luke was writing, and Luke was telling this guy, Theophilus, the account of what Jesus' ministry was all about. And then he closes that book with Pentecost, you know, insinuating that, hey, that wasn't it. There's some things coming in the future. But also, toward the end of his book, he talked a lot about the suffering of Jesus, the sufferings of Christ. And he also wrote Acts for a reason, and we'll get to Acts in a minute. Now, go to John. John chapter 1, verse 1. Look at what John says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you go to the book of John, you know what you find? In the beginning was the Word, and the... Let's go write this right. The Word was Jesus, we find out later, and that Jesus is God. So John is a book that tells us that Jesus is God. If you read John, did you know John also wrote other books? This John wrote the book of Revelation, and he also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So these two guys, Luke and John, wrote more than one book. Why? Maybe you should read their other books. <laughs> then, but many denominations today don't go any further than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's so, it's so odd to me that they don't read the rest of the Bible. Maybe it's because they don't understand it. And you know what? I've had some people confess to me of different denominations throughout the years. I don't understand the Bible. That's why I just stick with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, you're shooting yourself in the foot. There's a lot more in the New Testament. This guy, Paul, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Maybe you should uh, you know, read some of what he wrote. Maybe you should read Acts and find out why Paul's in the Bible, because that's what Acts explains, why Paul is in the Bible. So why was John written? You know, John tells us why he wrote the uh, Gospel of John in John chapter 20 and verse 31. John chapter 20 and verse 31, John says, But these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might l have life through his name. So John confesses and he says, The reason that I wrote the book of John, this epistle, uh, not epistle, but this Gospel, is so that you would believe that Jesus is God, which entails believing that He's the Messiah or the Christ. Now, I don't have time to get into it, but I've got a, a preaching on the difference between the who versus the what of salvation. If you get a chance, go look up that video. Because what you find as you read the next book, the book of Acts, is that the book of Acts is a transitional book. When the early church started, it was only Jews and those early Jews all went around preaching who Jesus was. The emphasis of their ministry, because it was a ministry by Jews to Jews, was to say, hey Jews, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is Christ. Well, if you look at how each one of these books portrays Jesus, you can't help but see that. Matthew went out of his way to portray Jesus as the King of the Jews, so that they believe he was the Christ or the Messiah. He was preaching who Jesus was. Mark was preaching that Jesus Christ is God's servant, so they believe he was the Messiah and the Christ. And the fact that he ascended up into heaven proved that he was God's servant. He was hoping the Jews would believe who Jesus is. You go through the book of Acts, the early book of Acts, when it's Jews preaching to Jews, it's all about believe in his name. Believe in his name, that means believe who he is. Luke believed Jesus is the Son of Man. John believed he's the Son of God. He's God manifest in the flesh. So as you get to the book of Acts, you, see, you come to an understanding that something happened to where there had to be a change. There was a transition that took place. What took place? Well, Acts, written by Luke, tells us that the early church was made up of Jews only, and they were going to the Jews in the hopes that the Jewish nation would, would accept 
their Messiah. But as we read through the book of Acts, you know what we find out? They don't. The Jewish nation as a whole rejects their Messiah. There's actually three times in the Bible that the nation of Israel rejects their Messiah. The first time was when John the Baptist came before Jesus' ministry. John the Baptist says that he was sent by God the Father. And you know what the Jewish religious leaders said? We don't accept your baptism. Strike one for the Jews. Jesus Christ came telling them, look, I am him. I am he. And the Jewish people said, we don't accept him. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And the nation as a whole, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, had Jesus Christ crucified. They rejected God the Son. Strike two. As you read through the book of Acts, and without Acts, you can't see this, in chapter 7 of Acts, there was a guy named Stephen. And Stephen goes before the Sanhedrin, he goes before the Pharisees, and he stands up and says, you've killed Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And they stone Stephen to death. Right before they stone Stephen to death, he said, why do you resist the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit? Strike three, they rejected the testimony of God, the Holy Spirit. So the Jewish nation as a whole, the religious leaders, the governmental system of Israel, rejected their Messiah three times. And these books were written for them to see that their Messiah had come. And the entire message until about Acts chapter 8 was believe in the name, believe in who Jesus is. That can't be denied if you simply read the book. So read it and you'll understand. When you get to Acts, you know what you see? You see God saying, okay, all right, those Jews rejected me. So now I'm going to go from the Jews to the Gentiles, and I'll take salvation to them. So the book of Acts is a transitional book, and it changes from the message to the Jews of preaching who Jesus is to a message to Gentiles of preaching what Jesus did. And the message that the, was being preached through Paul, because God called Paul to preach this message, was go and tell everyone what I did. Go preach the gospel. And the gospel that Paul preached was 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, and it's believed that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day, according to scriptures. It's what Jesus did. Very seldom do you see Paul going around and telling people, now believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah, in the beginning of his ministry he did, but when he went to uh, Gentiles... His whole thrust was, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust what He's done for you. Trust the Gospel. Don't just believe that He's the Messiah. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous to tell a Gentile, Jesus is your Messiah. Have you ever thought of that? Because the Jews had a law, and under that law, the Jews, those people, Jews, were promised a Messiah. A promised seed to them. That seed was not promised to Gentiles, it was promised to Jews. So why would we today go to a Gentiles and say, believe Jesus is your Messiah? <laughs> That's kind of, that doesn't make sense. Jesus wasn't our Messiah because we're not Jews. He was the Jews' Messiah. Well, God saw that they weren't going to accept him as Messiah, and he came to die on the cross to, to pay for the sins of the world and to save people. So God says, all right, the Jews don't want me. Well, I'll just go to Gentiles. And I said, Paul, come here. Go tell them that I died on the cross for their sins and tell them to trust what I did for them. Now, do you see that? If you don't see that, then read the book of Acts. Please, please read the book of Acts. Because that's what the book of Acts explains. It's the change from Peter to Paul. It's the change from Jew to Gentile. It's the change from water baptism to be forgiven, to being saved and sealed with the Holy Spirit by faith alone. It's a change from those early signs... The Bible says the signs are for Jews. Two, faith alone, without signs, with no uh, wonders and miracles. And that's what the book of Acts is all about. Now, I'm not time to go through the book of Acts. I wish I did. <laughs> but if I did, I could show you that beyond any shadow of a doubt. I'm not teaching some teaching that man made up. I'm simply showing you how to understand the Bible. And that's how to understand the Bible. And how important that as in the Old Testament there were five old books that were important, that were called the law. In the New Testament, the first five books are so important to an understanding of the Scriptures and an understanding of the New Testament. Now, the book of John is a little bit different. John, in the Bible, was the apostle that Jesus loved. And we're told in the Bible that John was the youngest of all the disciples of Jesus. 
Now, the book of John was written way, way later than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so when John wrote, he had already met Paul. And some of the things that God revealed unto Paul, old John picked up. And what's interesting is there are some things in the book of John that do not appear in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And some of them point to Paul and his ministry. It's quite amazing. Like what? Well, in John chapter 1 and verse 12, many as received him, to them have ye power to become the sons of God. In uh, chapter 3, ye must be born again. You know, nowhere in Matthew, Mark, and Luke does it say you must be born again. Only John says that. Well, what does Paul say? Paul says, I have begotten you through the gospel. He says, you're born of the Spirit. So, born again. And John's the only one that mentions it. Why? As, a, as the youngest apostle, he held off, probably wrote last his, his uh, gospel. And he had already been introduced to some of the teachings of Paul. Now there's something also. Savior of the world, John 4, 42. Well, 1 John 2, 2, 1 John 4, 10, he says Christ is a propitiation, not for us only, but for the sins of the whole world. So many of the things that were revealed to Paul for Paul to preach, old John kind of back wrote into his thing there. And it didn't appear to any of these others, in any of these other Gospels. Here's an interesting one. You go to John chapter 10 and verse 16. John chapter 10 and verse 16. Jesus Christ is speaking there. Verse 9, he says, I am the door. Then in verse 16, Jesus is speaking. And remember, Jesus said, I only came to the sheep of Israel. Only to Israel. But then in John 10, 16, Jesus says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, but also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So even though Jesus only came to Jews, in the back of his mind, he said, you know, I'm going to save the Gentiles in the future. So the book of John is a little bit peculiar. Yes, everything written in John is still in the Old Testament until Jesus dies. But old John brings out some of the things that Jesus said in his ministry that these other ones didn't understand. And so there's some things in the book of John that were mentioned that the other three Gospels don't mention. It's interesting. For that reason... Many Christians for centuries have printed what they call the Gospel of John and Romans. And many times they would print a John and Romans. Why? Because John was written to show you that Jesus Christ is God. And Romans is written to show you you're saved by faith and not by the law. And so it's important, it's interesting, but it's also important, you know. You ought to know that Jesus is God and that God died for your sins. So you have this preaching of the who and the what. It's not wrong to believe that Jesus is God. That's important. Nowadays, we live in a world where people don't believe that the Bible is God's Word, and they don't believe Jesus is God. And so, sometimes it's good to give them the who message first, so that they will realize, oh, you mean Jesus was God? And then all of a sudden, wow, look at what God did for me. But you have these two different teachings. So, John was written for both Jew and Gentile to read. And we as Gentiles, looking back, we can see there's some things that John put in his book that, wow, they kind of apply to Paul's ministry. So now, today, we have these that, that are lost, thinking that the law saves them, and they call themselves Christians, but they're not. They don't understand the Bible. We have others that believe, well, I believe the Bible, but I only read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they try to follow things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but they're not saved. And then we have some other people who say, well, I believe in the book of Acts, and they only read a couple of chapters in Acts, and they believe in speaking in tongues and being baptized and doing these other things. If they read the rest of the book of Acts, they'd see that that was for the Jews, but that's not for us today. So the way to understand the Bible is make sure you read all five books. And once you read Acts, if you read it and understand it, it will point to this guy right here named Paul and why Paul is in the Bible. Do you know that today we are not under Jesus' ministry? We're not under John the Baptist's ministry. We're not under Peter's ministry. We are under the ministry of Paul, according to what the Word of God says. Because a transition took place from Jews to Gentiles. We go to Romans chapter 10. And what we find out is, because the Jews rejected Jesus Christ and the message of who he was, that he was the Messiah, God called Paul and said, Paul, this is the new ministry. Your ministry to go out and get Gentiles saved by preaching what I did for them. Trust what I did. By faith, you're saved if you trust what I did, the gospel. And in Romans chapter 10, verse 11 through 13, 
we read, yeah, it's 11, I put 10, Romans 11, 11 through 13, I'll get that right, it says verse 11, I say, then, have they stumbled, talking about the Jews, that they shall fall? God forbid, rather through their, uh, their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak unto you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. Paul says that God came to save the Jews. He says salvation is of the Jews. Jesus gave the Jews three chances to get saved by trusting who he was, and they didn't. God said, Paul, come here. Now it's your turn. You preach the gospel of salvation. Tell people to trust what I did. And God says, they're cut off. I mean, they fell. But because of their fall, now Gentiles can be saved. And we read further in Romans 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Now look at verse 16. Paul speaking that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. The book of Acts clearly shows the change from Jews to Gentiles, from Peter to what God called Paul to do, which was preach what Jesus did, preach the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Go to uh, Romans 11 again, and verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. See, now God is dealing with Gentiles, not with Jews. Verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved, as is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and he shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. There's a future time when God is going to go back to dealing with Israel. And that time period is known as the tribulation, Daniel's 70th week. So Israel, they kind of cut their own throat there by rejecting their Messiah. But God loves them and he's going to go back to them. But because they rejected their Messiah, God called Paul to be the apostle to the Gentiles, gave God, Paul the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, and told people, and you go and you trust the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. So now we understand the Bible. Now we understand why there's a whole lot more of the New Testament than just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts. Why now Paul's books are in order after the book of Acts because we're under Paul's ministry. But after Paul's ministry, the rapture takes place. And why does the rapture take place? The rapture takes place to get the church out so that God can go back to dealing with the Jews. And how will God deal with those Jews? Why, I believe it will probably be the same way he dealt with them before. It will go back to this message of who Jesus is. And so they'll be believing in who Jesus is. And we're told in the Bible that there's two witnesses, and there's even another 144 witnesses. And they're going to go, and they're going to tell the Jews, Hey, guess who Jesus was? Your Messiah. So I've got a message. If you get a chance, go to YouTube. It's called uh, The Church Age, A Parenthetical Period. This isn't just something that a denomination made up. This isn't a teaching that I teach because I'm a Baptist and we believe that. Not all Baptists even believe this, unfortunately. I just simply read the Bible and I see this from reading the Word of God. Do you see it? I hope so, because this is what the Bible teaches. Either you see it or you don't. Sadly, there's a lot of false sects in Christianity today. Many of them are lost because a lot of them are still trying to be in an Old Testament rather than the New. There's other ones that are lost because they're trying to be under Jesus' ministry rather than Paul's ministry. And they think water baptism saves when we're saved by grace through faith alone in the gospel. And water baptism doesn't have a part of salvation. You can be baptized after you're saved, sure, but it doesn't save you or doesn't keep you saved. Others read through Acts, but they only read a couple chapters and they want to hang around in Pentecost. <laughs> they don't see, no, 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 it changed from Jews to Gentiles. We're under Paul's ministry today. And we're saved by the gospel that God gave Paul. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Are you saved? Have you ever seen the gospel? Why don't you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-4 through and read it? Because we need to all be on the same page and be of the same mind. That's something old Paul said. And the way to do that is to understand the Bible. Do you understand? 
I hope you do. I appreciate you watching this. I hope it's been a blessing to you. I hope it helps you to understand the Bible. Uh, many people have told me that these have been a blessing to them, these teachings that I do. And that's what I want to be, is I want to be a blessing. But I also want you to put into practice what you've learned. Go tell others how easy it is to understand the Bible if you just read it. It's not that hard. So thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. God bless you.